everybody, it's Fight Club Hubs. Welcome to another episode of Game Adaptations, where I talk about games that are usually adapted into various forms of media, video games, usually can become movies, comic books, serial, you know, all that wonderful fun stuff. So today, uh, I'm going to be talking about the Zelda comic books from the early 90s that uh, I mentioned at the end of the last episode, where we talked about the Legend of Zelda cartoon series from uh, Deke Animation. You know, the same people that also brought us the Super Mario Brothers Super Show. Yeah! But, uh, right now the adaptation we're going to be talking about are going to be coming from Valiant Comics with their Zelda uh, adaptation and from Nintendo Power's Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past adaptation. Um, we're going to be starting off talking about the Valiant Comics effort, as a matter of fact, because that one actually, you know, I have very fond uh, memories of that from when I was a child. <clears throat> for let's just start off though. Um, Valiant Comics, if you're not familiar, they are a studio that uh, started in 1989. It was usually a bunch. It was a few members from Marvel Comics that broke off and started, you know, the comic uh, company known as Valiant. And uh, throughout the history of Valiant, they uh, they did create a portfolio of some interesting comics. Uh, there was Magnus the uh, robot fighter who had a knack for fighting against the oppressive order of robots by chopping them in the neck or whatever. And then there was Solar, the man of the atom, and I don't know much about him, to be truthfully honest. But uh, those are their most notable uh, comic franchises. Uh, alongside Turok Dinosaur Hunter, after they were uh, acquired by Acclaim back in 1994, uh, to which they were rebranded as Acclaim, and then... In 2004, Acclaim went bankrupt, and the company decided to rebrand itself and keep itself alive and called themselves uh, Valiant Entertainment. And then as of last year, 2018, they were bought by DMG uh, Entertainment. So they're still going. They're just being owned by a whole bunch of different people. The Legend of Zelda franchise is actually one of like a couple of video game-based property comics that they made in the uh, early 90s. Licensed by Nintendo, um, based off the success of the uh, Mario and Zelda cartoon uh, from Deke Entertainment. Um, whereas the Zelda cartoon was based entirely on just the concept of the first game, the uh, Zelda comic was actually based around or incorporating a lot of elements from Zelda 2. You had, you know, various enemies that came from the game, various items and characters. Uh, locations. It was it was very interesting. The first thing I do want to get into, and it's very obvious, is how the comic itself continues the art style that was first presented in the comic in the cartoon series. Uh, however, it's been given more of a mature look. Like Princess Zelda, you can see like right there, she uh, she has a more mature uh, features added to her, uh, more feminine features added to her as well. Um, Link, on the other hand, for whatever reason, they goofed him up, gave him a hell of a lot of head hair, like he has a mullet, but it's in the front of his head, and he's got this big old long nose. Um, artwork is pretty nice, the coloring is okay, I mean, it's, it's your standard early 1990s fair with watercolors, and, uh, the details, the penciling, the penmanship is very nice. Uh, there are a couple of times where it's like rough in spots, but you know that that's just something that happens. Other things that I find enjoyable about the art is you know just how they how well they capture the essence and look of let's say Zelda two, and then they bring it to the pages, which is it's really nice looking. I mean, it's not like you know the Japanese artwork, which to be truthfully honest, from the manuals they look kind of goofy. So it's it's nice to see them giving a more mature look to them. The thing I like the most about the comics was just how they didn't exactly treat their audience like idiots, whereas the cartoon series did a lot of pandering to kids. Well, excuse me, princess. And simplifying their story at lines and having some really, really far out, like, crazy things going on, not to mention this insane surfer crap from Link. Here, the stories are actually well thought out. They actually show progression in regards to characters, you know, evolving as the series progresses, like they'll show Zelda, who has to constant, 
contemplate the idea of, oh no, what if Link is no longer around? Like, he gets killed off by Ganon. I have to pick up the mantle. So she goes on a couple of missions to, like, you know, train and learn how to use the Master Sword. She even has to go and, you know, make some really difficult decisions. Like in this one quest where she goes to a town that's been attacked by Ganon. And there's this child that's been poisoned. And it's during a time of, like, some kind of new moon or whatever. Or, ecl or, or, or solar eclipse. Where Ganon is at his weakest. And the town people are like, you have to save my daughter. And Zelda's like, yes, I'll do that. And then this old wise man's coming up like, no, you, you have to sacrifice the one child and take Ganon out so more children won't die. That is crazy. <laughs> that they would put something like that, that deep into these comics that are actually made for kids. Other storyline elements which I find interesting was like Link actually having a, a, a home continent to come from. He, uh, he has a home, he has parents, we meet them. He has a queen that he actually allies himself with a couple of times, who he serves under outside of, you know, Princess Zelda. Uh, other things I liked was an embedding, a blooming romance between Link and Zelda. They actually share feelings for one another. They express them. They try to go on a couple of dates, <laughs> which don't go well because their idea of what a date is is pretty kind of weird. Other things, like, like, Ganon, he is not the main bad guy in this one, although he, he is treated more as a background presence. He does come out every now and then, and he's treated as this mischievous evil being who is doing what he can to get rid of Link so he can have no problem getting the Triforce of Wisdom. But they don't pan out well, mainly because of a bunch of factors and plot device. Some of the things that I liked, how they adapted, was pretty much just how they used the monsters as more of, like, the henchmen that go out of their way to try and, you know, screw up Link's day. Like, they have this wizard character that is reoccurring that shows up uh, about two or three times. Um, Ganon doesn't like this person, but Ganon takes advantage of a situation of a mission that the wizard fails and now makes that wizard pledge its allegiance to Ganon, which I think is nice. That's a, that's a good idea right there, um, you know, for story building and all that, but... Sadly, there wasn't much story building to be had because it was it was done after seven issues, which, which kind of sucked. I would have liked to have seen how far it progressed with its world. It seemed like it had a lot of great building block moments right there. Things I don't like are some of the ham-fisted things that they throw in there. Like, some weak storylines include, like, you know, Link meeting a childhood friend of his who is, like, three times his size and constantly beats the crap out of him when they roughhouse. Uh, and he steals the Triforce from Link by befriending him. Um, and his excuse is Ganon was holding his pet frogs hostage. <laughs> and he always plays, like, Link's gullibility and naivety. And it just felt like a weird story. Some of the issues I have with the comic, uh, like, I, like I said, some of the artwork is a little rough. I mean, everybody's given a more mature, realistic look with the exception of Link. Some of the monsters, the colors aren't that vibrant. Like I said, they look like watercolors. They don't pop. They kind of like blend in with one another. Other issues I have is how insanely text heavy the comic is. It just steals so much from the reader of their involvement because it has to panhandle to the youngins so they have to read in order to understand the situation better and the comic that I'll talk about the Link to the Past adaptation does this a lot better with limited text that they have but overall, I would say, you know, it's a harmless little comic. You can easily find it for free on the internet to read. Just go ahead and check it out. I mean, I don't think you're going to waste much time watching, reading it. So check it out if you can. It's, it's something that's very interesting. It's ten times better than the cartoon. And I wish the cartoon was this good, to be truthfully honest. If anything, we might have had a second season of the Zelda cartoon if it was like this. If it had the same type of writers. Well, excuse me, princess. Now, the second comic I want to talk about is the Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past adaptation that first showed up in the issues of Nintendo Power magazine. Nintendo Power serialized this comic along with Super Mario World for their magazine, and it was pretty much, pretty much just to promote the release of the Super Nintendo and their two flagship titles that came out. Nintendo actually... Light, uh, got artist, manga artist, famed manga artist, uh, Chitaro 
Ishida Mori to pen this comic. And if you're not familiar with who he is, well, he worked on Astro Boy in his early career. He created Cyborg Number no. 9, The Genma Wars, uh, Super Sentai, and Cayman Riders. Just to name a couple of things so you know who he is. You can he, His artwork is easily recognizable because he, he tends to have very similar character models uh, across everything he does. In fact, if you look through this art, uh, the, the, the Zelda comic, you're going to definitely notice, you know, how some of his characters look like they're from Cyborg Number 9 or, or, or from Astro Boy. Some of the things I like about the Legend of Zelda comic for Link to the Past is how well it ad adapts the, the story, but at the same time, it kind of deviates a little bit from it, and that's kind of one of its weak points right there. I'll get to that a little bit later. The things I like about how they adapt it is pretty much for the first half of the visual novel, which, by the way, you can buy in its entirety, like right here on Amazon for 15 bucks. It's 180 pages. But for the first half of the comic, it almost follows the story of Link to the Past word for word. Well, not word for word, but uh, from plot point to plot point. Link getting a telepathic mes message from Zelda to go to the castle. He sees his uncle getting struck down. Uh, saves the princess from agoning him. I can't pronounce his name right, so sue me. They escape to the church. Uh, unfortunately, Zelda's recaptured, and she is used as a means to open up a portal to the Dark World where Link gets trapped in. And that, from there on, that's kind of where everything deviates. And by that, I mean, in the game, you have to rescue seven maidens in order to be able to go after uh, Ganon to save the Dark World and the Light World. Well, here, one, two, skip a few, finds a map, he's at Ganon. Rescue Zelda, too. They really, they don't, they, they only show a couple of maidens. They have a couple of things where Link fights monsters that I don't even remember are in the game, like a three-headed dragon, one with ice, one with fire, and then the black head of the dragon doesn't do anything, it gets shot. They introduce a new character by the name of Rome who acts as a rival to Link, but he's not introduced again th until halfway through, and his rivalry is more or less his ego uh, with Link in that he thinks he is the legendary warrior of light, uh, even though Link has the Master Sword, and Rome wants to prove it by defeating Ganon and rescuing Zelda. He seems kind of ham-fisted, but the idea there is novel. I kind of like that. Some of the other characters they're introduced, Link talks to them 90% of the time through telepathy or through an ancient artifact. And they're pretty much useless other than the fact that they'll give him like a piece of information once or twice throughout this 180-page book. Probably the thing that strikes, that strikes me the most is really how beautiful the artwork is. Like I said, even though the character designs are straight out of like, you know, Ishinomori's entire catalog, <laughs> um, it's beautifully drawn. I just love this style of art right here. And Everything else in the background has strong, vibrant colors. It's beautiful looking. Every panel is easily a work of art that you see in there. And um, it's just nice in general. Now, one of the things I mentioned that uh, I enjoy the most, which was a problem in the uh, Valiant comics, was how, much, how, how there was a ton of words uh, scattered throughout every panel, making it practically impossible for you to just get emotionally invested in a character through silence, and that's something that a comic should ha utilize once in a while, is like have powerful looking panels where there is silence, and let the uh, the reader, you know, ingest what is going on, absorb it, get emotionally attached to it. It, it makes it moments like that more impactful, and there's, a, there's quite a bit of that in the comic. It's actually well done. Um, I mean, yeah, it does get, it does have a lot of text bubbles all throughout, but it's, it, they, they have those moments where when silence is needed, it's there. It allows the moment to be a lot more powerful or impactful for whatever the scenario is. It's really, it's really good, and it's, it's a nice change of pace. If I had to nitpick about anything, it's the fact that Ganon is a throwaway character, uh, uh, both artistically and story-wise. In fact, like I said, uh, the second half of the story, they rush through it. 
and Ganon is probably in the book for five pages at most. He does not look threatening at all. If anything, he looks grumpy. Looks like he didn't have his cup of coffee in the morning. <laughs> I couldn't take him seriously. I mean, granted, he does look a lot like his video game uh, counterpart, but I can't take him seriously as this giant galactic or uh, interdimensional threat to the light and the dark world. But overall, I really enjoyed this uh, adaptation. If you have it in you, I recommend it highly to go to Amazon and just buy this. It's if it's on sale, five, ten to fifteen bucks is usually what it runs for. Check it out. It's it's definitely worth your time. It's a fun ar archival piece, uh, looking into the early '90s, if you will. I really enjoy it. To be truly honest, I don't I don't know how else to say it, and it's it's something that I recommend wholly. Uh, again, like I said with the Valiant Zelda comics, I mean. It's not going to hurt you to check them out. I mean, they're harmless. It's it's interesting to see a superior product to the cartoon, to be truthfully honest, and what we could have had if they had the right kind of writers involved. And with that said, uh, I want to thank you guys for uh, tuning into this uh, episode of Game Adaptation. So, uh, next time, uh, I actually might lose my shit because I'm about to see a movie that I was originally excited for as development went along, I just got madder and madder, and now I'm going to have to check it out. Till next time.